So um, I will make a start. Um, so first off to say, I'm Emma Hoddinot. I'm one of the Assistant General Secretaries here at the Co-op Party. And you're joining us for one of our regular um, Co-op Party lives, um, our regular Zoom calls, telling you about the, the latest issues, latest policies, and also hearing from some fantastic speakers as well. Um, sort of our politicians, but from people from the wider movement as well. Um, I've got to do a bit of a boring bit um, before, um, just in terms of the, the housekeeping. Um, so everybody will, be, everybody will be on mute. Um, we will hear from our fantastic speakers, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions. You can ask the questions in the chat or there'll be an opportunity to contribute at the end as well. Um, we are recording this. If you don't want to appear um, on our YouTube channel, which is where these videos go afterwards, um, then please keep your um, video off so you don't appear on that. And then finally, subtitles are available. If you click the closed captioning um, button at the bottom of Zoom, um, you'll be able to get captions as well to hear with us. If there are any concerns or anything, uh, you can message the host um, during the Zoom call as well. Um, but without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce uh, tonight's topic, um, but also our amazing speakers as well. So we're talking about sustainable high streets. And our high streets should be the beating hearts of our communities, our towns and our cities. But we know that our they are struggling. We know that our boarded up shops and venues all over the country are um, suffering from, I guess, a change of our shopping habits, um, a change in our economic um, fortunes and changes in our communities as well. We know that they are struggling. We know there is decline. But here at the Co-op Party, we know there are answers to this as well and you'll get here some amazing examples about what is happening already all over the country and um but also hear from um uh, uh, some speakers about uh, our policy going into the general election um as well so i'm going to introduce our first um speaker which is jim mcmahon and for many of you as our members who won't need much of an introduction he is chair of the Cooperative Party, um, but he's also the Shadow Minister for Leveling Up Housing, Communities and Local Government. Really pleased that you can join us here tonight, Jim. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emma. And thank you for everybody who's made the time uh, to join this session today. I think uh, it's timely uh, in terms of just coming through the local elections where a lot of those campaigns were very much thought about uh, place. Uh, both in terms of a positive vision for what can be achieved in a place, but also, frankly, uh, the very desperate situation that many of our town centres and district centres are facing at the moment. And I think if you look at how symbolic our town centres, city centres and our districts are, um, you know, I, I do think they are more than um, the kind of retail spaces or hospitality places or even civic places. I think for many people, they are the barometer uh, of whether... Uh, a place is doing well and going in the right direction or whether a place is going in, uh, not doing too well and going in the wrong direction and I think you know for many people now uh, those town centres are the barometer about whether a government is achieving uh, for their community um, or not. Interestingly I think the Tories are aware of that if you look at a lot of the language about levelling up around place if you look at the establishment of the towns fund uh, the future high streets fund if you look at the community ownership fund you can begin to see a number of pieces being brought together here where there is at least a recognition that these are politically important battlegrounds to be had uh, and there are ideas to be contested. And for Labour and the cooperative movement, it's about us showing our credentials and also an alternative, really, because for all that money and for all that investment, now we can argue about the foundations being taken away from communities and that's an important part of it. We can argue about the planning uh, process and that's another part of it as well. But fundamentally, we need to come forward with an alternative. So if our assessment is that the town centres uh, that we represent are fragmented, that they've been hollowed out, that we don't know who owns them, that communities are disempowered from taking action when they want to take action, that things are being done to communities instead of with uh, communities, that there isn't a single plan for a place, it's being done in a very fragmented, uh, fragmented way, then it's for us to come up with an alternative about how we might 
uh, repair that. And so uh, the Cooperative Party, as Labour's sister party, is working very hard to try and piece all that together. And there's a couple of ideas uh, that have been developed. The first one is a community right to buy, because you'll know in your own town centres, uh, when you see a bank or a post office or a local pub or a shop come empty, quite often it's the developers who move in. And I know in my own town, when I walk, walk around Oldham, some of the best buildings are being completely swallowed up and being converted into HMO accommodation, uh, single person accommodation. That's removing that vibrant shop from that we used to be there in the first place. But it's also changing the nature about how the town centre works as well. There isn't the ability at the moment for the community to intervene because there are no rights for those kind of mass high street stores. We've done uh, the kind of uh, community asset uh, register in the past in my own area. We've done that with local pubs. We've done that with the Oldham Athletic Football Ground. But of course, you can't do that with the whole of your high street. You've got to have a more active um, set of rights for the community in that. And so the community right to buy and giving communities power is a really important part of that. Uh, the second one, if you think power is important, well, pounds matter as well. Uh, and actually having the money in place to be able to buy it, if you do have the power, becomes even more critical. And, and I think the kind of what and the total is important, but also the how we do it. And so the government currently have a community ownership fund and uh, I'm supporting local football club to bid in for that. And there's a number of other projects that are making the way through the process. But it's very, very uh, involved. It's very time consuming. And frankly, it's a very centralised process. I do think we need to think far more about devolution, about our combined authorities, about local authorities and parish councils uh, being part of the mix about community response to being able to provide access to finance for those uh, facilities. The third thing is about a plan. So if you've got the power, you've got the pounds, you need a plan. And that's about having a plan for the place. It's not just about individual buildings being picked out one by one. It's about having a coherent plan that drives the future of a town or district centre. There's no point in taking over a building on one hand if right next door there's going to be a use there that completely is counter uh, to the audience that you want to bring in uh, or even send the town uh, backwards. And then the, first one, for, uh, the fourth one, sorry, which won't be a surprise, uh, is about taxation. You know, we all know the number of local independents who will set up on our high street for the right reasons or invest in their life savings quite often, uh, and that's important. But they struggle to make the first year, the, more, the first 24 months, because the minute they get the business rate bill and other, you know, corporation tax and the rest of it, they really struggle to get their head above water. And it strikes me we haven't yet created a level playing field beyond the kind of the online retailers where they're thriving, where they're making money with the on-street presence, which are essential for the uh, community economy and the social economy, that just isn't that level playing field um, in place. The final thing I'll say is that a lot of our uh, interventions in the core party speak to each other. It's all about people, it's all about place. And so if we sort out the ownership uh, and transparency and we get the rights in place and we get the money in place and we have a single plan in place, you do have to create places where people want to go. Uh, and I can't be the only MP who constantly reports people feeling unsafe, people feeling vulnerable. Uh, you know, many town centres be in no-go areas at night because people just do not feel safe and they almost get handed over uh, to, to young people with nothing better to do or even kind of organised criminal gangs. And, you know, I, I would link in at this point uh, the Cooperative Party's uh, uh, campaign on retail workers. You know, many of our convenience stores are the foundation of our communities. But if you think about your district centre, they may well only be the only facility open past five, six o'clock in the evening. Uh, and in the end, they become very important for the community to be able to thrive. And importantly, they become a magnet, you know, whether it's people going to the shop or using the cash machine that might be associated with it. They are very, very important anchors. Well, the truth is many are marginal. And if they're a victim of organised crime who are shoplifting and making that store and not be able to wash its face and make money. Ultimately, when the decision comes commercially about which stores to keep open and which stores to close, they become, unfortunately, the stores uh, that potentially face closure. And so we've got to address uh, how areas function and that they feel safe. And our retail crime campaign was very important for that. And that's about, in the end, making retail crime a standalone offence because, of course, assault is an offence. Uh, thieving is an offence. We know all that. But I think there is something unique about retail workers here, which is that Parliament makes laws all the time that we expect people to enforce on our behalf, usually the police and people in authority. But in the case of retail workers, think about the sale of alcohol, the sale of cigarettes, the sale of fireworks and knives. You know, these are legal responsibilities that we're given to retail workers to enforce on our behalf. 
But in enforcing that, they're often right at the brunt of dealing with people who are aggressive, who are threatening, uh, and quite often, unfortunately, who are violent as well. And in too often uh, cases, the police just don't turn out. And so we believe that the campaign on retail workers is a core part of making town centres and district centres places where people want to be uh, and places uh, that can thrive as well. I come off mute. Thank you very much, um, Jim, and for um, setting out um, a lot. I guess a lot of the issues that high streets are, are facing, and and sort of the multiple dimensions of that, but also I guess the multiple dimensions of the response from us at the co-op party as well, in terms of what we're campaigning for. And we had a, a great. Um, campaign day only a few weeks ago around high streets and highlighting some of these issues as well in the in the run up to the the local elections. But really interested to get a bit of a different um, perspective from on this. So I'm going to hand over to Kate uh, McKenzie, who is from Power to Change. I understand portfolio manager for Power to Change. So I'll hand over to you, Kate. I'm really interested to hear your perspective on this issue. Thanks so much and very good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to try and share some slides, which I have tested, but we'll hope that they work. Um, so hopefully that's now got a nice title screen. Um, and I've been asked to do kind of five or 10 yes. minutes just on a bit about Power to Change, introducing uh, you all um, to our organisation, if you don't know us already, and talking a bit about the things that we're calling for on the high street and a bit of the kind of evidence and reasoning behind that. Um, so... First question is, how do I make my slides move? So um, about Power to Change. So we're um, an influencing organisation that backs community business. Um, and we exist because we believe that communities and specifically community businesses can really transform the fate of our declining high streets, um, as well as all sorts of other areas within our economy and within our world. Um, and so um, kind of specific to this evening, I'll, I'll be talking about how we work to make the case for community led regeneration on high streets and town centres. Um, to give you a quick overview of kind of community businesses um, as kind of a typology of organisation because they are slightly different from other organisations in the social economy and um, community businesses are specifically locally rooted and locally locally accountable organisations um, and they trade for community benefit so they're organisations that work within a local place um, against the needs of the people who live there um, and really kind of driven by what's kind of needed and what's the, what the kind of aspirations are of that local community and they trade as well as having kind of grant funding coming as well and um, there are about 11,000 community businesses across England which is the um, area in which we work um, and those range across a huge different types of, of kind of organisations so there are community pubs community shops community hubs offering all sorts of different community services um, as well as community-led housing groups community energy uh, kind of all sorts of different sectors so to tell you a bit more about what we're up to at the moment um, in 2024, we're working across three themes, one of which is taking about the high street. Um, and in this theme, we're backing community led action on high streets and in town centres and really advocating for the power, the backing and the resource that communities need to do this really important work. Our two other themes, just to give you a quick insight, um, one is around financing the future economy, um, which is advocating for access to the right money at the right time for community businesses. So looking at fle uh, flexible capital and patient capital and making that much more widely available. And um, our third theme, which is releasing community power, advocates for communities having the power to change what matters to them in their local area. Um, and Anushka might touch on this as she's quite involved in our work on community power. Um, and how we work, we work by testing and learning. So um, we are kind of a think and do tank. Um, so we do lots of kind of policy thinking, um, but that is backed up by kind of research and action on the ground. So uh, we pilot, we put money and investment and resources into demonstrators. We really listen to the community businesses who we serve, understand what their challenges are and kind of help them respond and figure out what is kind of necessary for, for us to help shift the system kind of in their favour. Um, so what we're calling for on um, High Street, um, so we've got 
kind of similarly to what Dim was talking about, we've got a community right to buy. Um, so this right will give communities the power to take ownership of important high street buildings and provide communities with priority rights to buy that property in which they've registered an interest. Um, it will also provide a generous window of opportunity to raise the funds that are necessary to meet the price. So we know that the current community right to bid is too weak. Um, there's a really low conversion between communities registering a building as an asset of community value and communities taking on ownership of that building. Um, so we've been really pleased to support the Community Ownership Commission um, and the Commission's report in this area and uh, delighted that Labour has adopted this policy recommendation and that the co-op party um, obviously are as well. Um, so what comes next on this? Well, we're keen to work on how to really implement a community right to buy to meet the challenge that communities face. Um, and in July, we'll be publishing a paper exploring how that community right to buy can be most powerfully implemented. Um, our second ask is for a British high street investment vehicle. Um, so this has previously been known as the high street buyout fund, and we're currently remodeling this ask as the British high street investment vehicle to work kind of alongside the principle that Labour's establishing for the community wealth fund and leveraging in £250 million of private investment against a £100 million government grant. Um, so this would create a fund that would help to purchase high street property on behalf of communities and then would transfer these assets into community management and ownership. We know from community businesses, we hear from them time and time again, that they really struggle to raise capital at pace to take advantage of opportunities to purchase and redevelop an asset on the high street. Um, and so the British High Street Investment Vehicle would transform our high streets by bringing communities kind of into those spaces, into high streets, into town centres, keeping more money in the local economy, um, because we know that local businesses and community businesses recycle much more money back into the local economy than other actors um, and reducing vacancy rates as well. Our final ask is for communities to have a say in the future of their high streets. And what that means is communities having a seat at the table early on in decision making processes. And that can be achieved through more collaboration between communities, businesses, local government, and through mechanisms like the community improvement districts pilot that we ran. Um, in 2022-23 um, and through local property partnerships which are being developed by a, a social enterprise called Platform Places who we've also supported. So at the moment in this space we're working to share our learnings from our pilot of a community improvement district program and to ensure the design of government programs such as the long-term plan for towns really hold communities as a crucial stakeholder in the high street and in town centres in the decision-making processes, making sure that communities really have the agency to be part of creating that vision and creating a, pl a plan for their local area. A little bit about why we're calling for this. Um, so I've pulled out a single community business just to give you a bit of an insight um, into kind of why we know this is so important and why we know it could be so impactful. Um, so um, introducing you to Back on the Map, who are a really amazing community business um, based in Hendon up in Sunderland. Um, so, um, yeah, Hendon was once the kind of economic heart of the area. In recent decades, it's kind of been falling into decline through the loss of industry. Um, and Back on the Map was born out of the New Deal for Communities. Um, and the business has now been running for over a decade, really empowering local people. Um, and it delivers community action and sustainable homes and now work on high streets as well. Um, so in 2013, they took on the former library in Hendon, um, transforming that into a community hub. Um, and since then, uh, kind of some of their main activity has been around becoming a responsible landlord because they heard from their community about the, you know, the low quality and kind of poor tenure of the of the housing that they could get hold of um, and so they now um, owns 87 houses providing kind of really good homes for their community um, and um, they were part of our community improvement districts pilot so I'll just tell you a tiny bit about that as well um, so um, our community improvement districts pilot I'm not going to assume that everybody's heard about it so um, we basically wanted to test a new community-led approach to high street regeneration we'd done prior research and we'd heard from community businesses that structures like 
business improvement districts do provide a means for business to engage in the development of local economies, but there's no parallel system for resident and community participation beyond indirect methods such as engaging with local councillors in the planning system. Um, so we piloted a community led approach in seven areas across England, each of which received £20,000 in grants, um, as well as support from a local facilitator. So somebody who could act as a critical friend, a troubleshooter, kind of a relationship broker to really test kind of what does it look like and how does it feel if the community take a more direct role in the kind of vision making and planning for, for their local area. So back on the map, um, uh, launched a community improvement district in Hendon. They acted as the leader of the community improvement district as it formed and developed. And they were working on Villette Road, their local high street, which is pictured here with Joe Cooper, their CEO, um, kind of in the centre there. So um, they developed their own branding, called it Heart of Hendon, and they used a physical presence on their high street to really start to engage their local residents and traders in developing a new vision. Um, for Villette Road and they engage more than 500 residents in developing a new vision for the street. Some of the kind of most important work that I think they did and that demonstrates why community improvement districts are you know, a really good idea um, is that they were able to bring in firstly those different voices um, and they used uh, lots of quick wins. So they actually boosted the profile of the community improvement district and encouraged people to visit the street by doing quite simple things, but things that kind of showed that they were taking action, such as installing planters, they put in a 20 mile an hour zone, uh, they put up better signage and they got the first Christmas tree um, back on the street after decades of that not happening. Um, they also engaged traders by using some of the funding from Power to Change to install car payment systems, which hadn't been available to them before, um, and kind of in helped increase their, their, their takings kind of on the street as well. Um, and finally, they identified um, the owner of a row of vacant properties on the high street, and they've now purchased those with their own capital um, and had a successful bid into the community ownership fund for £168,000 which will refurbish those um, vacant units and bring them back into use for the community. Um, so I think back on the map um, kind of really works to illustrate the three different functions of a community improvement district um, that we found um, which was convening new types of, of kind of stakeholder, convening new conversations, doing work that wouldn't have happened kind of without uh, the community improvement district kind of being in place, amplifying resident voices and kind of people who don't normally make it to the table, um, creating new ways for the community to, to be involved and really achieving that practical change, which was far more powerful in driving progress than the idea could have been alone. Um, so this is my final slide. So a bit of a recap of what we're asking for and um, a kind of linking in, um, you know, what does this tiny case study that I've given you kind of tell us about the kind of asks that we have. So I think, yeah, back on the map shows what's really possible when a community comes together to act on what matters to them. And they've really successfully acted to revitalize their high street and take on assets. However, they are pioneers. They've got a 10 year track record um, and we need to give more communities the power, the resources and the backing to enable them to bring more local high streets back to life. So we think that giving communities the right to buy assets that would be achieved through a powerful community right to buy will be really invaluable um, and the time to raise those funds essential in bringing the assets into community ownership and use for the long term. Um, we know that providing access to capital at pace, which could happen through a British high street investment vehicle, would enable communities to seize opportunities um, and realise their ambition for their local high street, giving them time and backing to develop their plans um, as they take on ownership. Um, and as we've demonstrated through community improvement districts, when the community is given a seat at the table, they are really effective at collaborating with a wide range of stakeholders to develop plans for their local areas. They ensure people are heard um, kind of across Across the local area and they really galvanize action. Um, so yeah, we are calling for more of that, more community improvement districts, more local property partnerships and kind of new and interesting ways for communities to take action kind of on what matters to them. Thank you. I think I may have overstepped the 10 minute mark ever so slightly, so my apologies. Only, only just, we had a little <laughs> <laughs> no, thank, thank you very much, um, Kate. And I think um, it's really interesting, obviously, um, on the same page about some of those key asks um, yeah. that we think yeah. make a difference. But obviously that 
example from Hendon shows what can be done already, even with all those barriers. And just imagine what we could do um, if we got those changes under a new mm -hmm. Labour and Cooperative government. And um, we get here one more example of what can be done now to hopefully inspire us about the change um, that we can bring about. And, and that's from Anusha um, Dayton. Um, you're uh, you're a founder of the Friends of Stretford Public Hall um, and a leader of the We're Right Here campaign as well. And we met at a uh, Labour Party conference last year where I got to hear about your amazing story at Stretford. But I'm so glad you were able to share this with the, the wider group. So over to you, Anushka. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, inviting me. I'm going to try and share my screen as well, just for some photos. Let's see how, how that goes. Um... Just a second, bear with me one moment. Yeah, hi, so I'm Anushka Dayton. I'm the former chair of um, and founder member of Stretford Public Hall, which is a community owned and led building in the heart of uh, Stretford, which is just outside Old Trafford in Manchester. And I'll take you back a few years, about 10 years ago when I um, first stepped foot into the building. Um, it's right in the heart of our town centre opposite you cannot really see there's an old um cinema that is completely boarded up and been like that for 20 years and on the other side of the street you've got um a 1960s mall that had predominantly shops shutting down most of the pubs in the area had gone and we had very few cafes and restaurants as well the decline of the high street in action i would say um, but despite that, Stretford's a great place to live and always has been, um, but it wasn't really perceived that from the outside. Um, and when I moved there, a lot of people just asked me why. When I first stepped foot inside this building that had been used for generations for um, prior to me living there as, as a theatre and a library and all sorts of community space, I hadn't actually been able to be inside it for several years because it had been owned by the council and was used as offices. When I heard that they were going to dispose of the building, that very first moment I stepped inside, saw these beautiful um, green tiles, I fell in love with it. And right there on the spot, the creed that me and my friend were going to save it. Completely naive as we had not a clue what we were doing, but um, we just ploughed on through and, and went for it. Um, first thing we had to do was convince Traffic Council, who owned the building, to um, not sell it to the highest bidder, because initially it was up for um, an open auction and we were up against a property developer. We spent, it's a very long story cut, very short, we spent a year convincing them not to do that and to in instead give it to an organisation that would provide not only the money, we gave them £10, um, but also provide a lot of support to the local community and to the local economy. And thankfully, they had faith in us and agreed that we could take on ownership. They gave us a full asset transfer. And as a result, we could then start fundraising for, for the building. Now, 10 years on, it's a fully functioning operational project. The back of the building is has got a co-working space at the bottom floor. Above it, artist studios. On the top floor, it's a parliamentary office for Stretford. And that is a lovely set of tenants who not only bring the building to life, but give really good um, revenue stream for, from, from their rental income. And the front of the building has a beautiful ballroom. I'm not quite sure if I've got a picture. Let's see. Well, the, here it is in action. Um, and uh, some other quite large spaces. And that we use in a complete mix. So there's commercial use. We hold weddings and conferences. Um, we also do a lot of nice stuff like art exhibitions and um, <clears throat> children's theatre up and running. We do a community choir, bingo groups as um, running groups. We do wellbeing Tuesdays where we do low cost um, therapy, where, yeah, um, yoga, all that sorts of thing. And then we also do a lot more frontline stuff. So particularly since COVID, the council took up and, sat and noticed that we had this incredible core of people willing to give up their time and energy to make Stretford a better place. We have over 100 volunteers that we could tap into. Um, and so when we became a mutual aid hub, it was really quick for us to get up and running. 
And as a result of that, we've been doing more and more frontline work. We run a, the community hub. Um, there are six in Trafford, and we, in fact, manage all six of those. We, we run the volunteer coordination for the whole of Stretford. We have... Um, we allocate out hardship grants to people for a whole wide range of uses um, and provide a warm hub, free ESOL classes, provide support support groups and, and a whole variety of other community organisations get to use the building and sort of have an ecosystem of, of groups that work together and provide support. And whilst doing all this, we're benefiting the high street. So because people come to us in an evening to come to say a bingo night or to, for a music night, they'll come also then go on afterwards to the newly opened bars or go beforehand to one of the newly popped up restaurants. And it just brings that sense of life back to the high street where it's not just, there's a reason to go there now. We had no nighttime economy and now it's thriving. And there's also the added value that we do of um, having volunteers that, that quite often end up being paid members of staff. So we've now got 15 members of staff. Um, we make sure local suppliers are, um, well, we try and support local suppliers where we can. So even though our turnover last year was £350,000, we, we haven't quite haven't got the number, but we've estimated that there's a significant amount more um, money that we've created through outside caterers and um, workmen and other people coming to use the building that has really been supported locally. And we try and get people to use social enterprises um, and ensure that the, the, the other organizations they use have that added layer of value. And we've been the community um, improvement district, uh, in community improvement district. So thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so we're one of the pilot org groups, and that's been really key in helping us navigate a space within the local community. We had a really good network with the local um, organisations locally, and we had a good relationship with the council, but it was quite separate and we definitely weren't very well connected in with the local businesses and now we've managed to create this um, space where we can all have an equal talk at the table um, there's going to be a Stretford day up in July where um, we're bringing all the community groups together and promoting local um, local businesses and we see it as a start of a really good long-term future relationship and I managed to do this with my friends with very little or actually no experience. And I feel that there's this untapped resource in and around every single neighborhood. There was nothing special about me and my friends that could do this, that couldn't be done elsewhere, given the right support and the and allowing, you know, to allowing it to happen. I now work on the back of that for the Architectural Heritage Fund, supporting groups taking on. Um, buildings across the country and I see time and again these wonderful projects like this where they're either becoming community hubs or is it, um, it might be they take on a building and support um, refugees um, in, back into education or homeless people into in cafes where they can get back onto their feet and, and full-time work or theatres or a whole range a whole massive range of um, organizations but and the ones that work are amazing but I see time and again where they come across barriers that stop them allowing to do it properly and it's frustrating and annoying that this isn't being able to these resource of people and passion isn't used properly and that's partly why I became involved in the we're right here campaign so this is a group of um, six um, national organisations, including Power to Change and Locality and, and various other ones, which I won't say them all because I'll forget someone, um, who all come together, and seven other community leaders such as myself who are doing um, some phenomenal work around the country. And we, we're asking for the Community Power Act to be considered as new legislation from the incoming government. And the new um, Community Power Act is asking for four key things. First of all, a community right to buy, which I'm really, really pleased to see is already um, really taken hold in it with the Carlton Labour Party. Um, 
And this will give communities the first right of refusal once buildings and spaces with significant community value come up for sale. And that will give us the time to raise capital. And I love the sound of um, the British High Street Investment Vehicle <laughs> for this. Um, and the time to build up their capacity and to make a really strong business case to ensure that they have a sustainable way of managing the, these organisations and, and taking on the, the um, assets that they'll be looking into. And also a community right to shape public services. And this will allow that um, greater collaboration between communities and public institutions when designing, commissioning and delivering services. And I think this goes into talking about devolution, which Jim was talking about earlier. And devolution, I think, going down into, into um, local areas is really, really important. But to get it onto a neighbourhood area is tricky. And I think it's one of the key things that if you use these anchor organisations, such as Stretch Public Hall or the many other organisations of people that really know and understand their very specific neighbourhoods, you, you, if you can tap into that and help them to so, um, shape public services and be part of those public services in a real, really clear way of co-production and um, co-creation, you'll not only get the better services because a lot of these groups are already delivering great stuff, you won't have, um, you, you'll be able to understand where the gaps are and also coordinate them together so that they will work together in a much more effective way. We, we found that the hall, you know, when there's stuff that the council do brilliantly and they do much better than we can ever do. And some of their statutory work that they do is, is really, you know, important. But we can complement and work with them in, in a way that makes the work they're doing easier and in the longer term saves money and improves the lives and places we live in. And that part of that then is there's a community right to control investment. And this is tied in with this as well, of increasing community control over key spending decisions. So when this money comes in, like we've, we've seen waves of these over the years um, of levelling up or of, um, high street funding, that the community anchors have a way, a vehicle in which to have a say over how those services, um, sorry, how that investment is spent in a, in a really um, practical manner. We're very, very good at doing little, and sorry, doing lots with little money. So it's worth listening to seeing how we can see that the spending, spending um, funds could be better used. And then lastly, is to introduce community covenants. And these work alongside with the concepts of things like community improvement districts. And community covenants are neighborhood level agreements that brings local communities, community, sorry, local people, community organisations and local authorities together to share, empower and make decisions. And that can be around those services and investments that we all know um, need to be distributed better than they have been recently. So on an end note, I sort of say, there is so much bristling desire and passion. People care about where they live and they care about their neighbours and they want to make where they live an, a, be a better place. They've got ideas and passion and enthusiasm and anything that can be done to bring down those barriers and support people to do so is really, really um, the way forward. Thank Thanks. you, um, Anushka. And it's always a really um, inspiring story of what you've gone through. Can I just ask, if you knew what you knew now when you started and decided to buy it, would you have done it? Oh, that's such a quick, would I, the, I did not have a clue the amount of work it would take, um, no, but I couldn't be without it. So yes, I would. My husband <laughs> might disagree. <laughs> that was, that's great. Well, um, well, now we open it up to, to questions. You can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hands. Um, but Jim, I just want to come back to, to you. Um, obviously, um, you set it out at the beginning, but some really interesting contributions on from Kate and Anushka, and I really welcome sort of your thoughts on that before I move on to the questions. Uh, well, I suppose it kind of to start at the beginning, I think Kate's framing of how this can all tie together, I think, is, is important. I think 
probably more for the Labour Party than the Court Party, because I think mean, the Court Party um, don't do everything, but it does what it does really well. The Labour Party needs to take the best of all that and bring it together. Um, and, but I do think it's got to have a really strong devolution thread on it. And I think, you know, kind of what the Labour Party set out is a kind of right powers, right places. Uh, but that can mean many different things to different people, depending on who you speak to on a particular issue. And I think one thing that we need to develop, and this is my responsibility on the front bench outside of the court party, is about what kind of the double devolution offer might be. So we talk about devolution, but by and large, it's from Westminster to our Metro Mayor and a bit to combined authorities and councils. We haven't really got yet a developed localism strategy. Uh, and I'm thinking kind of neighbourhood plans plus, you know, so neighbourhood plans in the way that they are about physical development and local communities have been able to drive the future direction of their built environment. You know, could you do that for um, for social development, you know, um, public services, uh, where communities can self-organise with support to develop that? Now, the challenge with neighbourhood plans is that they are generally frankly, the preserve of the middle classes. They are for communities who can self-organise, who have the capacity or in the community, who come together and choose to do that. The actual support for communities that don't have that inherent capacity is actually very weak. And so I, don't, I want to make sure that if we do go down the, the same kind of road as that in terms of structure and format, that we have the kind of community capacity building bit in there uh, as well. I've actually been interested in um, Town Hall. I think it might have been like a, a, a Labour Party CLP um, room booking uh, and it's a really kind of magnificent building as all these kind of municipal town halls were and you definitely get a sense of a uh, of a township uh, that, that had um, status but, but I think probably more than that you got a sense that it, the community had taken over it you know if you to compare that I think to many town halls district town halls where you know where we are in Oldham where the council still runs them they are magnificent in the same way um, when kind of townships were thriving but it's not quite the same. They're quite corporate, actually. Uh, and I think kind of the sense of how you feel going into that, I think it's actually quite important for people in the community to feel uh, that it's accessible to them, that they have a sense of ownership um, for it, that it's not a corporate asset owned by the council uh, in kind of an authoritative way, uh, if that makes sense. So, I mean, I got quite a lot from that conversation, I suppose. The, the thing that's in my mind, and all that power to change um, do do this, Um I don't think every council will have the capacity to do this and do it well. Um, and I do think we need to think about how we develop a network of one kind of practitioners who know the nuts and bolts and the technical uh, hurdles and the rest of it, but also kind of community uh, conveners, you know, the people that can inspire uh, in the way that they're doing Stratford to say, well, this is it, you know, proof of concept, it works. Um, I think the other thing we, we haven't talked about is um, how you might tie this in with other things that are taking place. So, for instance, obviously a number of us have been affected by bank closures. Um, and there's a lot of talk about community banking hubs being established. There's not a lot of talk about the community actually owning the community banking hub that the banking service might operate. But then you might put other things around it, like the post office service or something else. So I think... It feels to me that there's lots of great ideas. We need to time together. I take responsibility that I've got a, a role to play in that and I'm keen to kind of continue the conversation after this. Thank you very much, um, Jim, um, for that. We'll, we'll take some questions as they've come in. Um, we've got a couple on screen and then uh, a couple have come in in the chat as well. So, Norman, you are up first. If you just want to say where you are, um, whether you've got any roles or anything that helps give us a bit of context. I think you just need to press a button to unmute. No, I'll just mute. Oh, there we go. I was going to mute. Uh, okay, now. Okay. I can hear you now. Good, good, good. Yes, my name is Norman Rimmel. I live near Matlock in Derbyshire. I have no particular role with regard to um, high streets, except I use them obviously for shopping and so on. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the, actually of the International Labour Party. I, I, I live in Lisbon a lot of the time, so normally I, I'm placed there. And there are big differences which I could comment on between the shop fronts and uh, high streets in, the, in Portugal compared with here, but I won't go into that at the moment. The aspect that I'd like to raise, which hasn't been mentioned so far, is the actual physical appearance of high streets now, it seems to me that whether high streets are thriving or whether they're run down 
many of them, I would say the majority of high streets, certainly in this country, look tatty. Um, the uh, shop, each individual owner of premises in high street is allowed to go their own way with regard to the uh, colours that they use and the design of the lettering and so on and the posters that they put up in the window. So um, the, 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 the places are really unattractive. Many of them are, are unattractive or they could be made a lot more attractive. Um, one exception to this is uh, Stratford-on-Avon, which um, I don't know if I expect most of you have been to Stratford-on-Avon, but if you walk down the uh, shopping streets there, you'll see that some attempt has been made to raise the appearance of shop fronts to a, a much higher standard than elsewhere, where great attention has been paid to the colouring and what a, uh, what, it, what what um, premises, what, what the owners of premises are allowed to put in the windows with regard to posters and so on, advertising material. Um, I think this is an issue that uh, needs needs addressing. No, thank, thank you, you Norman. So, yeah, uh, important question, about, I guess, about what we call uh, in local government the public realm um, side of things. Um, uh, Marina. Hi, hello. Hi, Emma. Um, thank you very much for organising this. It's been really interesting listening to everybody. My name's Marina Ahmad. I'm the re-elected just in the last five days um london assembly member for lambeth and southwark um Congratulations. And, uh, thank you very much and our feet are still hurting from the campaigning um what i wanted to ask um is uh, kate very specifically so I, i'm the labor spokesperson for economy at the london assembly and high streets very much fall under my remit and over the last three years i've been working with bids at business improvement districts and looking at you know issues there I've not come across community improvement districts and I'm finding you know I find this very interesting very exciting I wondered could you tell us how the two how the SIDS and the bids work together um and you know are, are you finding any problems with them dovetailing thank you Marina I've got uh, Gregor, if you want to ask your question, and then I've got a couple in the chat that I'll throw back to our panel, and that will probably do us. Uh, I uh, I ask uh, Kate uh, if uh, she knows about people uh, who are poor, and she knows uh, that people they looking for job or. On looking for only take the uh, funds, you know. So I, I guess you're asking about the the skills and and employment opportunities. From no. this. I I see she help the people. She have a plan to help the people, but that people what she help. She knows. They looking for job or uh, only they looking for take the money or food or something like this. Okay, thank you. And so I... she, she uh, and another question: How many uh, buildings are uh, should be renovated? Because there are uh, history. There are many buildings. There are not real. Uh, for living in the house, you know, there are. I, and Gregor, I'm going to stop you there because somebody else has also asked that question. Um, okay. So, um, I think it's a really good one about, I guess, how which buildings we do um repurpose. Um, we've got a question in from Susan. Um, about the pressures councils are to maximise income and the housing crisis. And how do we make the case for repurposing municipal owned buildings in this way, as opposed to selling to developers for creating more housing, including social housing? So it's a really good question about, I guess, the, the appropriateness of these and, and what we should um, do with, with some of these buildings on the high streets. And finally, um, there's one last question um, that's coming from um, M Stanton, which is really interesting. I, again, I guess about some of this 
the strategy and how you choose this but local authorities sometimes get into trouble investing in things they haven't got the expertise for and certainly we can think of some of the examples in local government um uh, where where things haven't gone well from investments how do we ensure that community ownership is supported but also balance that around the local authorities' responsibilities on governance so things are sustainable so i think there's some really interesting questions all linked together there about about the why so i'll come to kate uh, anushka and then um jim to to wrap up as well so over to you kate thanks for those wonderful questions um so I think I can pick up most usefully on um, the question that um, we had around bids and SIDS um, from um, the lady who's part of the London Assembly. Um, I can talk a bit about um, kind of which buildings we might repurpose and how kind of roles can be supported as well. Um, so from the perspective of um, yeah, business improvement districts and community improvement districts, kind of how they work together. So um, in our pilot, um, we chose organizations and kind of groups of people who wanted to test different types of approaches marina so we had some uh, community improvement districts that were led like the one um by back on the map in hendon by a community group we had others that were led by business improvement districts um, and we had others that were led by local authorities as well so um we found that um in lots of instances one of the we had two bids leading um, within the pilot. One went really well, and that was in Ipswich, um, and it allowed the bids to just really kind of expand the people that they were talking to and make sure that those voices were kind of get, getting into the room. It brought a real kind of richness um, and the ability to make sure that what was being kind of developed and delivered really responded to kind of a wider range of needs and the community, you know, came in and, uh, you know, backed up what was, was kind of being thought about and kind of added kind of lots of vibrancy through that. Um, we did have one bid um, in Wood Green who tried to run a community improvement district, which went less well. Um, I think mostly because of um, the kind of need for that business improvement district to uh, kind of go to a revote and kind of reconstitute. So the kind of timing didn't work that well. I think, you know, trying to figure out exactly what role each different organisation and stakeholder would play kind of took a bit longer on that. And what we found is that, you know, quite a lot of people swallowed time on governance um, and a various different kind of approaches came through. There isn't like a single kind of perfect model of a community improvement district. It will always need to respond to its local context. Um, but yeah, in by and large, we found that uh, adding communities in has kind of, yeah, brought vibrancy, richness, you know, is all kind of all good things. But really happy to pick that conversation up kind of directly if that's helpful um and in terms of um kind of which buildings do we repurpose like um through our kind of plans and thinking about the British High Street investment vehicle, we've thought about perhaps 200 buildings over kind of a five year period. So, you know, we're thinking in kind of huge scale compared to what's going on at the moment. But um, I think as Anushka said, you know, there are communities out there with passion and with, you know, the drive to do something in their local areas. So the sky might be the limit. Um, I think it, it will obviously need to respond to each local kind of context and to what the community wants in each space we're not suggesting that community businesses would ever lead an entire high street but they're kind of important kind of piece of the mix and i think they bring real diversity and resilience to those um kind of streets in which they they operate um so yeah uh i don't think anyone has a final answer on that but certainly i think you know given the resources and and the money there's certainly loads more that can be done and you know happy to kind of help push that in the right direction Anything else you'd like me to pick up on? I'm aware um, I've... Okay, just the, the I guess the link to employment, and I guess yeah. when we're thinking about um, community businesses and and things like that, you know, is this generating employment on our high street? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of, I don't have specific. Um, Kind of research on community business specifically on high streets but we know that community businesses um, employ you know a greater proportion of people from the local area um, than a, a kind of a quote normal business would do um, and that actually it's a really good route in 
um, to employment for, for kind of people within the community as they're able to often take on a volunteer role, kind of get involved in something that's got that kind of structure that then helps them towards the workplace. And community businesses are involved in, um, you know, delivering all sorts of different services in this area as well. So, um, you know, there's your kind of traditional community hubs, but there's also all sorts of employment and training services, kind of debt advice, anything that it, that the kind of local community um, are looking for and that that organisation can provide, they will tend to kind of pivot in that direction to try and, yeah, to try and kind of make that happen. That's great. Now, um, Anushka, uh, your thoughts on any of those questions? Yes, great questions. Um, I think I'll sort of discuss a little bit about the high street in general and how you tackle an area. So um, we've, we've seen some great work being done by... Um, through heritage action zones and through there's an organization called Platform Places who, who are currently look at mapping um, very specific high streets, looking at the ownership of buildings, trying to see which ones are vacant, why they're vacant, and, and trying to find clear pathways to, to ownership, be it to the sold and used and leased as a more commercial venue, or whether or not they can be turned into housing or whether or not they can be community owned and run. Because what we we found in a lot of um, our high street work that I've done through the Architectural Heritage Fund is variety is the key to bring high streets to life. There's not gonna be one answer. And, and Norman's point about making these places look nicer. You know, you don't, it's not nice to go shopping in an area where it's all run down and not looking great. And, and there's been like in Oldham, there was the town, Townscape Heritage um, Initiative, which did wonders for the city centre, like for that area around the town hall. And those those sort of projects, if you can do them in a way you, where you um, get local businesses and communities involved in those decisions and get really behind the schemes, it can really have a big impact on a sort of a larger scale than, than um, individual projects themselves could ever have. Um, and alongside that, I'd say um, ab about the sort of added value of, of being able to get people working more. Um, I do think community business is much better than a lot of other organisations, a lot of other businesses at trying to help people into employment that haven't been in employment for a long time or have struggled traditionally to, to get into work, be it through volunteering, be it through apprenticeships. Um, and it's having that capacity to be sort of a slower um, businesses in some ways and, um, and more rounded that can mean that they can they can have more impact that way. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, there's a lot to consider um, with this and in terms of, I guess, how we put into practice and the scope for it and the huge opportunities. Um, maybe that's one for the politicians. So Jim, um, um, if you want to pick up any, I guess, of those reflections um, and in those questions as well, and in general, from what we've heard this evening, just in summary. I mean, the thing that stood out really is an overwhelming sense of kind of the power of place. Um, there was very little of the conversation actually where people were saying, do you know what, I really need a new baker or a butcher or a candlestick maker. Um, it was all about how people feel about the place where they live, whether that's the the visual thing about whether it instills pride or depression in some cases, um, or, or, or whether they get a sense of optimism about the future or um, negativity about continued decline. I think the power of place is something I think that in politics is a very, very powerful identity, uh, is very powerful as well. And I think um, we haven't really touched on it, but you know the direction of many town centres was actually becoming carbon copies of each other where the local identity and the history of places were being slowly eroded uh, as everywhere feels the same. You know, the kind of the national uh, retailers and bookmakers and the rest of it were taking over the, the high streets and actually your local independents were really squeezed out because of high rents and high rates. It does feel to me as though we're at a tipping point now where because they have essentially exited many of our places uh, in favour of going online, they have freed up these civic places, these social places, these heart of the communities uh, to become, uh, I, I think, places where local independents can begin to thrive again and compete. Uh, I think ownership does matter, and we keep coming round to this. Um, and I think, you know, actually councils, uh, 
they need to be careful. You know, debt levels are not in a good place. Uh, council finances are certainly not in a good place, uh, and council should not be borrowing money uh, to uh, for frivolous um, kind of purchases. However, ownership does matter. And if councils can use their buying power on behalf of their community to buy key assets, not everything, but, you know, the end building of a row that if renovated and brought back into use, that's the statement of the rest that can follow, then I think they will ask a good use. If they buy a building that has a heritage value because of its status as an old bank or an old pub or a civic building that's currently in decline and use that uh, as, as a kind of... Uh, a marker of what can be achieved, then I think they ought to be doing that. That's exactly what councils as makers of place should be doing. And I think they should be um, supported to do that, but they can't do it by themselves. And I think the final thing they'll say is that we do need to bring together uh, all these disparate funds around the Shared Prosperity Fund, Future High Streets Fund, the Towns Fund, the Community Ownership Fund, essentially into a single pot. Uh, where communities themselves can self-organise, they can develop their own plan for the place, they can bring the money together into one place uh, and then have a plan that really brings that together. And I think some of that should be about activity and which is actually buying the asset, you know, about encouraging people through small grants. I mean, we did it in Oldham for our independence quarter where we gave, you know, students that were leaving the college uh, enterprise funding, you know, £5,000 grants where they could set up their own business and we would help them with a pop-up business but also help them trade online and the rest of it. You know, it, it, this could be very, very exciting for the cooperative party and for the Labour Party uh, and kind of, you know, for kind of civic society. Uh, I, I think after quite a long time of people feeling hopelessness and that things are being done to them, I, I do think we are at a tipping point now and we should really uh, kind of own that. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jim, and really appreciate that and, and the support from you on the front bench um, for this in terms of, I think what we've heard th this evening, I guess to summarize is, is some of the challenges, but actually the opportunities um, that we could get under a labor and cooperative um, government. I think we've demonstrated through the great examples that we've heard from Kate and Anushka about what can be done and actually taking those further steps and um, some of that coherence in terms of how we talk about our high streets and how we support our high streets could really open this up and really change things um, for the better. It certainly gives me hope, gives me something to campaign for, uh, something to get out of bed in the morning for in terms of bringing about that change. Um, we do have a, a lot more information online and we have a campaign pack. So if you're inspired by what you've heard um, this evening, please, please feel free to, to get in touch. Um, and take these ideas forward into your own places as well. So it just leaves me to say a, a massive thank you to our panel. Really appreciate you taking um, the time. Um, so thank you to Anushka, to Kate and to Jim as well. Really inspiring um, contributions and a huge thank you to our participants as well. So I'll leave you to go and enjoy the sunshine. Thank you very much.